problem was one where we live in a world of sustainability, of net zero, where we're obsessed with the environment all the time, where public health becomes the dominant imperative in our life. Beware of the new normal. I'm joined today by uh, Emeritus Professor of Sociology, Frank Ferretti. Uh, Frank is a known quantity to our audience if you watched our lockdown summit from June 2021, where he spoke about the illusory trade-off uh, between our freedoms and, uh, and uh, the uh, safety that uh, the mechanisms that were put forth through the pandemic response would offer. And uh, we hear on the new podcast, the Elevate podcast, as we bridge the world from uh, the, the, the extensive conversation we've had on the pandemic to now looking forward into what the new world may look like. Now, uh, this conversation comes at a really appropriate time because we've, well, we're still amidst the pandemic, you could argue, uh, but we're now tackling other global issues, including the conflict in Ukraine. So today we're going to explore a cautionary tale about the new world. Uh, this episode is entitled Beware the, uh, the, the New Normal, and uh, we are going to unpack the state of the world as it uh, currently stands and explore where it could all be heading and what we may be able to do to influence the course of the uh, unwritten future. Now, since the late uh, 90s, Frank has been widely cited about his views on why Western societies find it so difficult to engage with risk and uncertainty. That was certainly one of the topics that we covered within the lockdowns summit. Uh, and he's published widely about controversies rates relating to health, parenting, food, and new technology. Uh, he wrote a book in 2020, Democracy Under Siege, uh, Don't Let Them Lock It Down, which I'm sure we'll touch upon today. Uh, and he's currently exploring a, a number of different issues facing Western society and asking questions pertaining to morality. So. This will be a fascinating conversation. Frank, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the Elevate podcast. I'm looking forward to an uh, illuminating conversation. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it as well. Yeah. So let's, where should we jump off here? You know, last time we saw you, we were talking about uh, whether the uh, trade off between fear and safety was an illusion in the context of the pandemic. And now we're facing a situation with the global conflict in Ukraine and uh, with Russia. Uh, bouncing from one crisis to the next is 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 crisis the new normal what do we what, what can we make of what's happening in the world right now well you know uh when when i first heard the expression new normal during the pandemic it sounded really familiar so what i did was i did a a check in the database newspaper databases that i have access to and i realized that the first time the, the term new normal was used but not as much as now, but just after 9-11. And the idea was that we're now in a new world. The old normal is gone. You know, we have to uh, give way to security concerns. We have to queue up at airports. We have to have our backs searched. We have to be on the lookout for suspicious people. And that's when it began. And then it gained momentum uh, after the economic crisis of 2008, when they began to talk about a new, new normal which was one where uh, the economy was flattening out. Uh, our optimistic reading of, uh, of capitalist uh, enterprises and uh, entrepreneurship, uh, entrepreneurship had to give way to a more modest view of what the world was. Uh, and it was predicted that in the new normal world, we were going to live in a more restrained economic environment, far less risk-taking than in the past. We had to make do with the fact that uh, ambition had to be lowered to some extent. And then what happens, of course, is in the pandemic, it really kicked in. Because in the pandemic, we were told, and this is the fatalistic message of the new normal, that at the end of the day, you and I haven't got the agency to determine our future. We haven't got the capacity to control our destiny. It's foolish to imagine that we got the will and the power to uh, make our way in the world. It's almost as if a virus decides the trajectory of the future for us. And somehow nature is telling us the direction we need to go into. And the new normal that was presented to us by the World Economic Forum was one where we live in a world of sustainability, of net zero, where we're obsessed with the environment all the time, where public health becomes the dominant imperative in our life. 
And for me, what the new normal that was promised to us uh, in this agency-less new world was one where you saw the uh, politicization of public health and the medicalization of politics. And you and I were reduced from the status of citizen to that of potential patients. That's really how the whole world looked to me. And what's been going on since the pandemic is really the continuation of that, but always mutating into a new form. And now with the war in the Ukraine uh, and global conflict, it's almost as if uh, we're continually are the warriors in a drama. We're like, you know, kind of watching the world unfold in front of our eyes. And there's very little uh, emphasis placed upon what we can do to control or influence the outcome of all these uh, all these kinds of events. And so for me, it's very important that we explore, examine, question, and even reject the new normal because there's, there's a lot about the old normal that I quite liked, and I definitely don't want to leave that behind. Thank you for that opening uh, juncture, uh, Frank. Um... It, it feels like somewhat we're living in a real life Truman show where, you know, this life is is, is somewhat on repeat. Uh, it's all predetermined. And yes, as you said, this agency list life that has been presented to us for the greater good. Um, fascinating to hear the original use of the term new normal. Thank you for sharing that. That's uh, that's a distinction that I hadn't made. Um, but I want to reference that point because you've been looking at this relationship between risk and uncertainty for, for quite a period of time now. Um, where, where do you think this trajectory begun? Had this, had, did, did this begin earlier than the situation in with 9-11? Has this been a cultural shift that we've witnessed over decades? Uh, I, 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 where, where does this have its roots? Well, I think the, uh, the origins of this uh, confusion about how to deal with uncertainty and, and the uh, tendency to regard uncertainty as a problem rather than as an opportunity really kicks in in the late 1970s and the early 1980s where western society begins to have a much more negative view of the future and increasingly the future is presented in a very dystopic fashion in fact from about 1980 onwards i cannot think of a single film where the future is represented in a positive way, as if, as if it's a better version of our world than today. It's always a question of survival. It's always some kind of negative, corrosive uh, sort of uh, drama unfolding in front of our eyes. And as you have this increasing tendency to see the future as something that's entirely negative, so we become distanced from uh, sort of uh, from what we could be doing in, in a different world. And we adopt what I call a very strong presentist mode. We're kind of living in the present. And our imagination uh, becomes paralyzed to the point at which we, we do not really look very far into the future. And, and the kind of plans we make about the future are entirely risk averse. So in, within the business world, there's a, a funny concept they, they invented called future proofing. I don't know if you come across that. Mm -hmm. and what companies do to future proof is almost uh, as if they want to adopt a very defensive form of uh, corporate behavior where you kind of expect the worst. That's the kind of the dominant mode. And you need to protect yourself from the worst because you cannot imagine that something good will kind of come out of that. And so what happens under those circumstances is that uncertainty becomes entirely something that paralyzes us. We fear that. And instead of developing a strategy for managing it, and finding a way of turning uncertainty into something that's, uh, that's, that can guide us. And that's what risk calculation used to do in the past. We kind of give up our hands and just basically declare uh, that uh, something negative and bad is likely to happen. And we've got to learn to live with the negative forces of our world rather than somehow construct a world that is able to deal with them and, and overcome them. Yes. Uh, this is a I, I was involved in a panel discussion towards the beginning of the pandemic. And one of the speakers had said, under these con these conditions of uh, profound uncertainty, you know, we must adapt our behaviors to, to correspond with the uncertainty. Um, and whilst in one, one, one regard, there was a heightened perception of uncertainty, 
what was fantastic is one of the other panelists kind of scoffed and said, life is always uncertain. We, we, life presents uncertainties. It's just the way in which we deal with those uncertainties has changed. And I thought that was a very profound distinction and, and how true, because in, in many ways, we, we actually live in, in very fortunate times that we're not living amongst, you know, we're not cave people running away from wildebeests uh, for our own survival. Uh, yet somehow we we seem to live in a culture of fear that is akin to or greater than such times. Yeah, and I think it's important to realize that the meaning of uncertainty is always determined by prevailing cultural norms. So there are, you know, there are historical moments when a particular culture regards uncertainty in a very positive way and goes out and explores the world and gets a buzz out of uncertainty rather than you know sort of fearing it and, and and becoming entirely paralyzed and there are times when uncertainty is regarded as a as a warning sign in a very kind of alarmist sort of fashion and the point at any rate is that uncertainty is something that as you say is always with us you know sort of it's not something uh, that can ever escape our destiny but uncertainty invites us to use our knowledge and our experience to, in a sense, to tame it. And by taming uncertainty, by, by reducing it, the surprises that it will throw up, we as a society and as individuals can flourish. Uh, so for me, uncertainty is a really interesting part of my life. And I don't know about you, but some, I remember when I was really, really young, like in my early 20s, I'd go out on a Saturday night you know, to kind of see, you know, what the action was and, you know, the uncertainty, not knowing what would happen, you know, really kind of made me feel extremely good, you know, what was going to, and, you know, the expectations and everything else. And therefore, you know, sort of uncertainty is not just individually, but collectively can be a, a really exciting, interesting kind of phenomenon. And even today, very often when I sit down, for example, to write a book, there's that, you know, and I've got, I've got no idea where that book is going to go. It's a completely, it's a complete mystery to me. There's something very attractive and kind of, I'm pulled into this uh, realm of uncertainty and, and there's no need to be uh, kind of worried about it. Of course, you know, if our culture tells us that this is a scary situation, then of course, a lot of young people regard uncertainty no longer as a buzz, but as something to avoid. I mean, even coming into this interview, you know, you and I were discussing poten the potential topics we could talk about. And um, we, you know, we, we touched upon that we could bridge the, the, the gap between the pandemic and the, uh, um, the, the conflict that we're witnessing in Ukraine and the idea of this new normal. But even in doing that, you know, all of my notes are out the window. And I said, great, this is exciting because it's an uncertain conversation. It could go anywhere, which is where I actually thrive because I get to just be with you and, 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 and uh, exploring the conversation as it unfolds. It could go in any manner of directions. And, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where I get excited. But, but then I, is, is it then because I think about my character and interestingly, as someone, you know, who, who my audience will know has challenged um, the what I perceive the threats to our autonomy, our sovereignty, and our freedom that we've witnessed over the last couple of years, um, is it a reflection of our inner personal values? Because certainly freedom has always been one of my highest personal values. But as an adventure, because you know that moment you spoke about going out on a Saturday night, I share that 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 the energy that comes with that. But I also I'm the kind of person that you know I've mountain biked down the world's most dangerous road, and if you want to feel a sense of uncertainty, put yourself on a mountain bike in Bolivia and hurt yourself down <laughs> at great speeds, uh, your breakneck corners. It puts you into the moment and gives you a sense of flow and presence that you know I struggle to get anywhere else. It, is that is that our relationship with risk and uncertainty a function of our inner personal values, or is it broader than that with our cultural values? I think it's more contradictory because. Um like you you know i get a buzz out of mountain uh you know walking in the mountain climbing in the mountain i love skiing I and mean, skiing is one of my favorite uh sort of things in life and i like taking risks you know, because I, I love the idea that something interesting is going to come up um but at the same time i like i'm sure you and many other people have experiences where we become a little bit paralyzed where we become a little bit hesitant 
where we're scared of taking that next step mm. because circumstances are such that at that particular moment we feel isolated, we feel unsure. Something happens in our life that uh, kind of creates uh, disorients at that moment. So nobody is totally risk-taking. Nobody is totally able to deal with uncertainty all of the time. But I think that uh, uh, our character, our, our individuality is very much shaped by a number of factors. And our cult and our culture norms is one of them. And, and I think that there, is, uh, there are some very powerful cultural norms today which make it difficult for people to be really risk-taking. Or even when they're risk-taking, they often become risk-taking in a very one side of it. Let me give an example. I know quite a few people who perceive themselves as real risk takers, they're real entrepreneurs, and they're making a lot of money. You know, they, they, they work in the Silicon Valley. And when you go there, you think these guys are total risk takers and you know, these are, this is really good. Then you go to their house, and as I've done, and you go into their kitchen and you open up the fridge and you realize that they got all, that they're typical Americans in the sense that, you know, she's got her food, because uh, these food bits are, are the ones that he cannot eat. He's got allergies that mean that you know, he's going to have his share of the, uh, of the fridge. The children are told that they mustn't eat this food because it's going to be really bad for them. So when you look at that kitchen, it looks like a scientific laboratory <laughs> you know, rather than a place where you want to get stuck into a meal because they've embraced this kind of uh, bodily risk aversion that a lot of Americans have where they are basically continually watching their diet, they're counting their calories, you know, they're, they're just not able to let go and enjoy food in the way it's, it's meant to be done. But at the same time, they're risk takers, usually with other people's money, but even sometimes with their own. So you can, it's a contradictory thing. Um, and the really important thing is that, you know, we need our culture to back us up to be brave and courageous and to promote that side of us, promote our active side rather than our passive side. And, and uh, you know, some of us are able to transcend that up to a point, but none of us, there's not, not a single person in the world who can entirely rise above all these cultural pressures that we experience in contemporary Western society. Mm -hmm. um, no, I relate to a lot that you've shared there. And, you know, even though I've shared my story of hurtling down a, a mountain on a mountain bike, uh, you know, similarly, I've had paralysis by analysis, you know, I've, I've become trapped by my own fears and self doubts, and it's, it's left me procrastinating. And, you know, the first three years of my own ventures into business myself, I was, you know, uh, encumbered by my own uh, fears and doubts. And so I've experienced both sides of the coin, despite being willing to take the risk. Unfortunately, I've waded through those fears to get to the other side, but it took some heavy lifting and some personal growth to get there. But it, it, I suppose it's interesting because on one hand, we have a, a need for uncertainty, but there is also this need for comfort, security and certainty. But I, I, to, to be brave enough to tackle that and embrace our uncertainty, I think, is a key. But when we're looking at a societal level right now, what I perceive is to be increasingly kind of paternalistic relationship with governments, uh, which which in many ways uh, leave us devolving our agency to these state actors in order to make these decisions and for them to become barriers of the risk. It, to me, this feels like a trend that is accelerating. What is your take in the wake of COVID-19 of how this is potentially playing out? Well, I think you're right. I, I think just as uh individually we need certainty so society has to have a narrative that gives meaning to people's experiences where people feel confident or you know at least uh, feel a modicum of confidence about where they stand in the world and if they don't have that or if that's been taken away from them as is the case very often then people become passive to the point at which uh, they invite paternalistic intervention in their lives and this is where I, I worry about the fact that as we're coming out of lockdown, you have a, a very powerful mood that is still hospitable to what, what I would call a lockdown lifestyle. Mm. A lot of people you know, are almost uh, worried about the, leaving the lockdown behind. A lot of people still wear masks. A lot of people uh, insist that working at home is just as productive and creative as working alongside 
the physical presence of other people, which is absolutely absurd. You have uh, in schools and universities this idea of blended learning, where instead of having face-to-face -face physical interaction, you do everything online. And when you have that kind of um, sort of uh, reluctance to leave the cave behind, and uh, you have this reluctance to embrace the freedoms that are, are now available to us, you can realize how much damage uh, that kind of lockdown paternalistic intervention uh, kind of caused. And that we're not over that yet. And, and there are a lot of casualties still along the way. And we have a big uh, job on our hand to convince our fellow citizens to go back and work in the office or in, in, in the laboratory rather than to sit in the digital bedroom. So that's, that is a really big concern uh, that is going to be around for some time to come. Mm, I think in addition to this lockdown culture, you're absolutely right, you know, that has proliferated, obviously, this work from home mentality. But overlaying that with kind of technological developments, the idea of the metaverse where, you know, people are living these virtual lives in, in virtual worlds, it's going to lead to people, A, being more sedentary, but 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 actually living this kind of voluntary lockdown existence whereby everything becomes increasingly virtualized. Um, my concern, all of this is, 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 is people will argue that, you know, it's, it's, it's going to reduce the amount we travel, it's going to be good for the environment, but all of a sudden we are basically humans living in a bubble and, and, and existing in this virtual ex ex space. Now, whilst I may be projecting a little too far about where things may head, it, it, I think the warning signs are there. What, what can we do to actually protect uh, one's agency and to actually whilst embracing new technology simultaneously retain a sense of what it means to be human and social animals <laughs> yeah well i think you're right that on the one hand we have to respect and take new technology seriously because they have tremendous potential to uh to kind of assist our, our, our life and our world but at the same time we cannot confine our experiences to the digital world or to allow the digital world to play a disproportionate impact on our everyday life. And it seems to me that what we need to do is, first of all, expose the younger generations to a wide range of uh, experiences to uncertainty. And we all need to ensure that we, we, are, we round ourselves up, we kind of gain, gain greater insight by being open be yielding to new experience. I, I, I know I felt this a few weeks ago because I was, I, was, I, I was feeling that something was not quite right in my understanding of the world, the way things were unfolding. So I decided a couple of weeks ago to spend uh, a couple of days in the Ukraine. So I went to the Ukraine because I wanted to see for myself what the war was like. I was, I was aware of the fact that a lot of the stuff that I was reading, uh, things on, on television, may not have corresponded to reality in terms of the real situation in the war. And one of the things that, you know, it's a really small thing, you know, a really small thing, it had a really big impact on me. One of the things that I found very inspiring was not actually people fighting, but the fact that I'm walking around this town in Western Ukraine and, you know, and, and there's a war going on and there are all these people by the river fishing in a very relaxed way yattering to each other i kind of walk around and in the cafes there are all these couples kind of kissing each other drinking wine having coffee smoking cigarettes looking at the you know sort of the, at the sunshine and for and, and if you if you don't know there's a war going on you think this is just a normal moment and, you, and then when you talk to people you realize that they're fully aware of the fact uh that, that there's a war going on because they hear the air raid sirens going off but at the same time, they have adapted themselves to these circumstances in such a way that is quite inspiring. You know, they are able to live with something that on paper or on a television screen seems absolutely unlivable, absolutely hell. But yet they are in their own way flourishing and rising to the occasion. And to me, that was like a really good, positive experience, something that I haven't seen in Britain for a while. You know, I'm sure there are comparable stories here as well. But we need to have those kinds of experiences to 
reaffirm our faith in our humanity and in the potential for human beings to take control of their lives and, and make things happen. Well, certainly uh, traveling to Ukraine during a perceived war zone is certainly embracing uncertainty, uh, Frank. But uh, I, wanna, I want to extract a, another component of that, um, which is the, the thread that you mentioned that you know our trust in institutions has fallen, our trust in media, particularly mainstream media, has become decimated in particular over the last couple of years. And now, in order to make sense of the world, we have to look to, to different means to do so. And experiential learning that you just described is one way we could do this. But but before we unpack how we can make sense in a world uh, where we face these threats, what what do you think? It feels like we're beginning you know, in that kind of Truman Show analysis. It feels somewhat that we're living in this kind of control. Everything has a controlled and acceptable narrative that that, that we're supposed to witness and understand and and and, and take on uh, through these kind of media channels. How how can this notion of agency or democracy even flourish under these conditions where the the way that the world's events are portrayed to us are seemingly contrived and controlled? Well, I mean, you use the word trust. Um, and I don't particularly mind that we don't trust the media or don't trust governments. But what I do mind is when we don't trust ourselves and where we don't trust our fellow human being, because that's a far bigger problem. Uh, in many ways, if you can learn to trust ourselves and learn to rely on our instincts and our intuition, and if you can learn to uh, trust our fellow citizens because we know they're going to watch our back, then that gives all of us a bit more strength. It's a bit like when you're, when you're on your own isolated, it's much more difficult to engage with problems than when you know that those problems are shared by a lot of other people around you. And through sharing those problems, you can gain insights and gain strength from the fact that you're all pulling together in the same kind of direction. So it seems to me that what we gotta do is somehow find a way in trying to create kind of a grassroots sensibility, uh, a sensibility where we you know, sort of rely in a sense on common sense, common sense that's specific to our circumstances rather than to the wisdom that comes down from high uh, by well-meaning experts. Because even the, you know, the, even the greatest, most intelligent expert is a stranger to my way of life my specific circumstance, whereas my neighbor isn't. And I remember I, I did a lot of work on this when I wrote a book on, on child rearing, because I became aware of the fact that all these parenting experts were lecturing mothers and fathers about how to bring up their child. And I kind of felt that actually child rearing is not a, a domain of expertise. You know, I, I'm the and my wife is the best expert about how to bring up our child because we are part of the same relationship. We have common assumptions. So instead of allowing these people to give us these lectures about you know, what the child needs, what you really needed to do was to have confidence in your intuition and learn from your experience. You, make, you might make a few mistakes, but you're in a better position to know what your child needs than somebody who's written this template book, you know, sort of a thousand miles away. Uh, who might not even be a parent themselves, but they have very, very strong views on the subject. So similarly with everything else, we need to somehow have a greater respect for common sense and for our day-to-day -day experience and use that to gain confidence and, and, and gain confidence to being able to rely on those people who are around us. Mm, I want to unpack this in the kind of culture of the kind of political environment where as it pertains to democracy and uh, linking our previous points around paternal this kind of paternalistic relationship with the state we've seen this rise of technocracy uh, reliance on uh, experts certainly through the pandemic and i'm sure it won't uh, stop there well you, how do we get the right balance between you know using the example you've just shared you know perhaps there is some expertise that we can draw upon to inform our intuition but not at the expense of our intuition is how, how do we how do we on an individual level get that appropriate balance of of learning and guidance uh 
from those who have walked a path before us or, or have a depth of knowledge in certain areas versus actually our own intuition on an individual sense. But then how do we unpack that at a societal level when it comes to democracy? Well, on the individual level, I think we, we have to learn to educate our intuition. And that means being open to the knowledge that is provided to us by people who are uh, who've got a, a strong disciplinary knowledge, who've studied a particular subject all their lives. We learn from them and we learn from experts who tell us, you know, this is what research indicates. Uh, but we don't ask the experts or the academics to tell us how to live our lives. We have to work that out for ourselves on the basis of using that knowledge and, and uh, applying it to our own specific circumstance. So we do that at the individual level. And at a societal level, it's the same pattern that, uh, that needs to work. So when you have a problem like a pandemic or a disaster or, or any kind of challenge facing the world, then we have to ask the experts what their expertise indicates. And they will tell us that this is, uh, this, these are the conclusions that we, that we have come to on the basis of existing research. And we take that on board. We take their research and their findings on board. But the policies that come out of it is a political decision that needs to be arrived at, not by experts, but by citizens. So if, for example, the scientist tells us that global warming is happening for this and that reason, that's fine. You know, I'm happy to think about that and, and, and to say its implications. But the policies that come out from that, for example, whether or not we are allowed to eat meat or we have to become vegetarian, whether or not we can travel using airplane to go on holidays, whether or not we do this and that, these are decisions that are both personal and political that we make on the basis of our calculation. Because when it comes to decision making, those decisions have got to take into account a whole number of variables, uh, which are ultimately can only be decided democratically by the citizens who are affected by it, rather than by paternalistically being told that this is what you must do. Because there is no, you know, uh, the, the information that experts provide does not immediately lead to a particular policy. It depends how you interpret that information in light of a number of other factors that, that is decisive, rather than what uh, any expert or any uh, sort of uh, academic tells you is the case. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, to unravel that a little more, so in the context of the pandemic, obviously we saw a certain type of dominant expertise within a very narrow or myopic focus. And there was the potential for group think group think in those scenarios as well um but but in addition to that kind of singular focus and myopic nature of that we also had uh propaganda uh, forms of propaganda throughout playing out through the media and i think we're seeing that again now with ukraine and russia um and then then latterly we've also got in the digital world we live in you know we've got the algorithm which is on the social feeds, which is designed to actually send us more information that uh, reconfirms our existing biases or, or puts us into situations where we resort to tribal behavior and demonize the other and end up in these polarized set of uh, extreme, becoming increasingly extreme ends of the spectrum. Uh, the kind of middle ground seems to get uh, trodden on within that kind of environment. Under these conditions, how how is it then possible for individuals and society to make those types of decisions uh, when when we have these kind of external threats to our ability to rationalize i think that uh, it's a difficult it's always difficult it, it, it this has been a problem that's been around for a, a long time it probably has become more intense because of the issues at stake and the challenges that we face but at the end of the day what, what we're talking about here is how can we learn to think for ourselves. Mm. Uh, and thinking for ourselves is never easy because there's always the pressure to conform. And that pressure works at all kinds of different levels. But there's a, you know, there's a way in which a, a section of society has always learned to think for themselves. 
uh, often under tremendous pressure and often facing ostracism and being uh, sort of marginalized by the mainstream. But nevertheless, at the end of the day, we have to uh, think for ourselves, which basically means we critically engage with the information that we're given. But very importantly, and this is something that's o overlooked, we also have to question ourselves. Right? We also have to question ourselves and uh, uh, ask the question, why are we uh, sort of saying what we're saying? Why do we think the way that we do, rather than just simply assume that you know we're God's gift to philosophy or or to the or God's gift to the to public health or anything else? So, for example, I'm always wary of people that almost overnight become amateur epidemiologists during the pandemic. They're not Ukraine experts in the war. They kind of almost seamlessly go from one to the other instead of having a bit you know a bit more of a, a reality check a bit more modesty and saying well i'm very interested in these issues i have a lot to learn i'll, I'll learn uh in a very kind of questioning way but i will always check my own understanding and make sure that i don't become one-sided it's very easy to become one-sided mm -hmm. especially for people like us because we're a little bit uh you know sort of fighting against the stream in the mm -hmm. world that we're we're kind of living in so it's very important that we ourselves uh are, don't become full of ourselves but we always question at the conclusion that we come to so we can balance out our inevitable uh biases that we kind of uh, uh buy into along the way yes i mean i came became very familiar with the dunning kruger effect and you know recognizing that you know you can you can through depth of study you can start to feel like you have a sense of expertise but the more expertise you gather the more you realize it's more complicated than you first thought um and you start to see things that you didn't previously see and i think that's such an important point um now this leads me to think about you know i mentioned tribalism and how you know we're we're, we're seeing this polarization of society we saw it throughout covid whether it is people who are pro-lockdown, anti-lockdown, pro-vaccine, anti-vaccine, and these labels that come up to describe categories of people, this kind of identity level um, extension of the culture wars, it feels. Where do you think this is heading in the guise of the new normal? Are we going to see an increasingly granular polarization of society? And is there an antidote to this that you foresee? At the moment, uh, in the short term, I don't see any antidote. I think the polarization of society is deeply entrenched, and that polarization very easily mutates from one issue to another. And you'll find that uh, that there's a kind of uh, lack of understanding, a reluctance to argue and discuss and debate. We we tend to talk far too much to people like ourselves, rather than having genuine arguments and discussions. I find very, very frustrating that very often I wish that people who take an opposite view to me would would have a dialogue and we can discuss. And I, I might even learn, you know, sort of quite a lot from people that are critical of, of my stand. But that's unfortunately not possible at the moment. And in many respects, I think what's really very dangerous is that as a result of that, while the society becomes totally polarized, we do end up in a world where the uh, dominant cultural norms uh, that have kicked in, the, particularly in relation to uh, the dealing with uncertainty, the taking of risk, the uh, uh, skepticism towards uh, the value of freedom, all these things are not going to be challenged. They, they, they're pretty much there. Mm. And, uh, and they're not going to be seriously challenged anytime soon, just because we're so busy fighting, you know, fighting uh, little battles. Uh, and, and not really thinking about these massively big issues all, that will ultimately determine the, the future of humanity. Yes, and I think this plays into this, uh, you know, there was there was really no breathing space between COVID and and the Ukraine conflict because, I mean, even, even the mainstream media picked up on this. You know, they were even mocking their own... <laughs> You know, some of the cartoons and some of the mainstream papers were just, you know, out with COVID in with Ukraine. They were even recognizing 
the lunacy of it the fact that it just went from one crisis to the next in with, with no there was no let up there was no like ah gratitude that life is somewhat coming back to normal that let's have a moment to actually celebrate the freedoms again no no time for that we'll get straight into the next crisis get our cortisol levels right back up to where they were yesterday and, and this this surely this surely must keep us you know, this this uh, i'm just wondering is this is this what we can expect now crisis to crisis cortisol to cortisol never actually addressing some of the systemic issues in our society what what what's going on here frank <laughs> well i mean the crisis in the ukraine is a real crisis you know sort of and uh, there are a number of factors that have you know sort of led to it which uh made the, made what is a crisis far worse by some extremely inept uh, thinking on the part of all the different parties yeah you know, it's not a black and white crisis although obviously russia is totally responsible for unleashing this war upon the ukraine so it's a real crisis but at the same time a, a real crisis in, is informed by our pre-existing crisis thinking mm. where or or to use a, a more uh, precise term our survivalist form of thinking where we basically uh, perceive every challenge that confronts us as a question of existence or a question of survival and once we get into this very survivalist way of looking at the world uh, where we tend to dramatize everything from a from personal disappointment all the way to an economic uh, sort of challenge or or to a political challenge it creates a situation where you know crisis thinking acquires this almost routine character and becomes a way of distracting us and or, or at least disorienting us from being able to make distinctions between uh, problems that are really worth reflecting on and dealing with and problems that are secondary in nature and 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 can easily leave aside for now uh, i think that's is really really important we have to stop thinking in this survivalist mode and, and uh, adopt a much more uh, sort of active orientation where we see ourselves as not just surviving but actually you know sort of getting on top and and being able to control and being able to exercise our will rather than allowing a, a virus or something like a virus to determine our future because ultimately what what this kind of thinking does is it makes us totally fatalistic you know there's a, it's almost as if fate you know ancient the ancient greek version of fate is hovering behind our back and it's uh, kind of pushing us or leading us from one crisis to the next. Mm, I think that's such an important point. It actually takes us right back to our opening gambit, really, about the ability to, you know, create a compelling view of the future and your reference of the science. Yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't thought about the movies from the 80s. Or, you know, it really does paint this bleak picture. It, it just reminds me of a conversation I had with a friend of mine. She's a, she's a she she belongs to one of the major climate change uh, organizations she said 25 percent of their time is spent on helping people to manage the uh, anxiety that comes with the work that they do and i thought 25 percent of your time and, and it feels like the way she described it i had this vivid image of people almost hyperventilating about the situation that they're facing it's like well hang on this fatalistic view on the world there's many issues in the world that we can tackle that are real issues but if we're going to enter into a state of almost hyperventilation, your mental hyperventilation before we even do anything. This surely must be absolutely creating havoc with our psyche. Uh, I'd love to hear your take on this and what, what could be done to look at things in a more calm manner. Well, you have to understand that uh, the kind of anxiety that kind of is promoted either unwittingly or on purpose by climate activists uh, is, is actually uh, plays a very important role in in almost kind of uh, performing respectability mm. because unless you're anxious about humanity's future unless you're anxious about the future of the planet somehow you're a, a lower form of human being and therefore there is a sense in which you know, climate activism and its alarmist messages very often you know, sort of self-consciously uses uh, anxiety and trauma and, 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 and psychological upheaval 
as a substitute for indicate, indicating its, its moral norms. So to be, to be ridden by anxiety indicates you're a good person and marks you out from all those people who are so indifferent or so untouched by this, the most important problem in the world that you, know, you can be easily looked down upon. And I think we have to be very careful in this because very often this kind of emotional upheavals that are dramatized on the media and, and people kind of buy into it actually is, is, is something that is itself what I call a performance of fear. It's a performance, in, in, not necessarily in a conscious way, but it's got this performative aspect that by being fearful, being anxious, signals that you are essentially a good and respectable person. So uh, that's, that's the interesting role that it plays. And, and therefore, I'm not surprised that they spend 25% of their time dealing with this because that is part of their métier in terms of their advocacy. Mm, mm, I mean, it's, yes, I mean, it's a problem of their own creation in this, in this sense, in, in many ways, through their own marketing messaging. But uh, you added an interesting layer for me there, because I know that advertisers and marketers have long understood that, you know, fear sells and that humans will do more to avoid pain than they will to pursue pleasure. And perhaps that's part of the, the issue that we're so uh, risk averse that we, we prioritize avoidance of pain rather than the pursuit of pleasure. And, in order to create that compelling vision of the future, you know, it, it, it seems that people are very good at standing against things, but not necessarily standing for things. And I think that to me has been a point of reflection off the back of the pandemic. But I will concede, Frank, that actually I, I agree with what you're saying around that fatalism and the anxiety that comes with it. But looking at the reverse of that now, you know, the, the, the people that are speaking out against some of these trends that we've talked about, it's very easy to fall into the same pattern of anxiety. You know, there's, there's, there's this very much this almost... Uh, us and them type of uh, mentality that you know it's 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 everything has already been predetermined by these central actors and that creates great rage and great great uh you know creates that kind of oh let's go get them let's change you know <laughs> let's let's fight let's fight the old uh but that comes with a sense of anxiety as well it's it it, it, it seems very hard to actually get into that point you know part of the reason we started elevate is to get into a different state of consciousness that we can actually get into a more of a a positive frame of what the world could look like if we applied our conscious faculties to doing so. I think you're right. And we all need to take a reality check because a lot of people I know assume that there are that this kind of powerful forces at work which control our destiny and who kind of control what we read and can manipulate us and they can use you know the internet and various social media platforms to completely push us in the direction that they want us to do. The human mind doesn't work like that, thankfully. And I think it's important to realize that the forces that are arranged against us are far less organized than, is, 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 than one suspects. And they themselves are uh, far more confused than people can imagine. And that their degree of control, you know, their degree of surveillance, uh, is far less systematic and, 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 and effective than, than we think. So there is a, a, a massive scope for us, in a sense, evading their influence and their control. But we have to believe in ourselves a little bit more. It's much easier to blame them for the predicament that we face than to critically ask the question, what have we done? You know, what have we done to fight for our freedoms, to maintain and defend them? It's very easy to point the finger at, at those individuals, but we need to be much more demanding on ourselves and understand that at the end of the day, you know, we have, we can choose to be free, right? We can really choose to be free. And once you choose to be free, the world begins to look a little bit differently than if you just talk about wanting to be free. Well, I'm almost inclined to say let's let's finish on that note because it's so powerful. But I'd like to give you the opportunity to think, just to reflect upon. You know, we we ask the question: Should we be cautionary? This, this cautionary tale of the new normal. Beware of the new normal. Um, I suppose this is under the, the pretext that the, the, the way it's presented that the new the, the new normal is determined by these outside factors. But if we have that freedom, we have that agency. 
what's a message of hope that you can share about utilizing that freedom and agency to actually be the own creators of our destiny? Is, is there a message that you can share that can yeah, inspire us to elevate beyond these situations? Well, uh, I don't know about inspire, but I'm, you know, I'm always aware of the fact that as uh, one Shakespearean character reminds us that the future lies in our hands. You know, the, the future is not a story foretold. You know, we, we don't have to uh, imagine that, that the drama has already been played out and we're two bit actors, you know, sort of uh, um, acting in accordance with a script over which we have no control. I think it's important to realize that uh, we, you and I and others, can play a role in writing that script. We can at least outline the direction of travel that we wish to follow and pursue. We may, we may not end up where we, end, you know, where, we, where we wish to end up, but at any rate, what I think is really important is the journey itself, the fact that we've decided the road that we want to take. We decided that no matter what, we'll walk down that road and, 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 and not allow anything to stand in our way. And I think in the course of doing that, we may well surprise ourselves that we have individual and collective strengths that can actually have a powerful impact in making the world in our own image rather than in somebody else's. Powerful. Well, I certainly feel inspired by those closing comments. So thank you, uh, Professor Frank Freddy. This has been a wonderful conversation. I'm glad that we uh, allowed the conversation to unfold as it was supposed to, to, to follow. Um, it, it, perfectly in some ways, uh, bridging the conversation between the pandemic and uh, the future world that uh, is in our hands to create, which is certainly the message that we're carrying here within the Elevate uh, podcast. Uh, so I'd like to thank you for sharing your uh, insight and wisdom uh, on, on the Elevate podcast today. I'd like to invite our audience to subscribe to the Elevate podcast. This is a brand new show off the back of what we created over the last couple of years on the pandemic podcast, really starting to look at how we move forward from here uh, as uh, as authors our own destiny. Uh, so I invite you to subscribe to our mailing list at danastongregory.com forward slash podcast. Uh, you can also join our private network where we are having more conversations just like this one uh, about how we can uh, uh, create a, a brighter uh, future uh, and that future is in very much in our hands to create. You can join us there at weareelevate.org and thank you again uh, to Professor Frank Ferretti today on the Elevate podcast with myself, Dan Aston Gregory. Pleasure.